Hi everyone. So myself, Dr. Garima Nirmal. I'm a DM pediatric hematoncologist. So in today's class, we'll talk about pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So coming to the acute leukemia. So before coming to the topic, we should know what do we mean by normal hematopoiesis. So as the name state, hemato means blood form, blood cells. Poiesis means formation. So, the formation of blood cells. So, as we all know that we have 206 bones in our body. And after the birth, the hematopoiesis generally occur in the axial skeleton. So, we have this bone and inside the bone we have this bone marrow. So, in this bone marrow resides these hematopoietic stem cells. So, these are multipotent hematopoietic stem cell and it has two characteristic property. So, it can self-renew themselves and it can differentiate to other cells. So, it differentiate either into common myeloid progenitor or common lymphoid progenitor which is called as, which is called as lymphoblast and this is called as myeloblast. And these lymphoblasts will form either B lymphocyte, T lymphocyte or natural killer cells. And this myeloblast will form thrombocytes that is platelets, RBC and few of the WBCs that is basophil, neutrophil, eosinophil and monocyte and that eventually will form macrophages. So this is how a normal hematopoiesis happens. Any disruption of these normal hematopoiesis will lead to abnormal proliferation of the cells that can cause leukemia. So, if there is any uh, aberration at this point or at this point, then these cells, these lymphoblasts, they will proliferate and that will abrupt the normal hematopoiesis. So, if it if it abrupts the lymphoid lineage, it is called as uh, lympho lymphoid malignancies. If it abrupt, abrupt the myeloid uh, pathway, then it is called as myeloid malignancies. And then if we say like leukemia, it is either acute. Acute means the duration of the symptoms, the onset of symptoms will be shorter chronic it will be of longer duration so in acute leukemia we either have lymphoid malignancies which is predominantly ALL or myeloid malignancy which is mainly AML in chronic we either have CML or JMML in pediatrics we are talking mainly about pediatrics so now coming to the epidemiology of childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia in, in the local term, in the layman, uh, layman term, it is called as blood cancer also. So, this ALL is common in the preschool age group. So, that is 2 to 5 years of age group. And they have higher incidence in boys as compared to girls. And if we talk about the ALL, so predominantly we can subtype it based on the characteristic of this blast. So, if it is, it is predominantly BALL in around 85%, then it is TALL in around 15% and only 1% is having this Burkitt leukemia or mature BALL. So, how to characterize this blast, whether it is a lymphoid blast or myeloid blast? So, it depends on the certain antigens which are present on the cell surface of or the cytoplasm of this blast cell. So, in myeloid, generally the CD13, 33, 64 and 117 are present. In lymphoid, it's either B or T. So, in B lymphoblast, they generally have the CD10, 19, 20, 22 and kappa and lambda is mainly seen in mature B ALL. And in T lineage, they generally are in single digit, like roughly we can remember it. Either it is CD2, 3, 4, 5, 8 or CD7. So, these antigens will be present and we detect them 
using some antibodies using the technique called as flow cytometry. So that's how we immunotype, immunophenotype a cancer cell into the different types of uh, lineages. So what are the risk factors for developing these malignancies? So patients with Down syndrome are at high risk of developing acute leukemia as compared to the general population. And they are at more risk of developing myeloid malignancies that is AML. And in AML also mainly AML M7 in younger age group. So if in less than four years, a Down syndrome child is having high risk of developing AML as compared to ALL. But up beyond the age of four years, the risk of developing AML and ALL is almost equal. Then patients with ataxia telangiectasia, as the name states that these patients will be having features of ataxia like cerebellar ataxia, skin and ocular telangiectasia. They are also at high risk of developing T acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Then a uh, patient with leaf from any syndrome which has TP53 mutation. So these patients have history, familial history of cancers. So they have a lot of family members which has different types of cancer like sarcomas, breast cancer, adrenocortical cancer. So these patients are also at high risk of developing ALL, speci specifically hypodiploid ALL. And even patients with Fankinese and Blooms are also at high risk of developing ALL. So now coming to the differential diagnosis. So there are very close differential diagnosis to these uh, childhood leukemias. So certain non-malignant conditions mimic the uh, presentations of leukemia. So aplastic anemia. So the child presents with features of pancytopenia. So here the, uh, in the, the main pathophysiology of the aplastic anemia is hypocellular marrow. So marrow is not forming the adequate cells. So the patient will have the features of anemia, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. But what are the differentiating features? So patients with aplastic anemia, they won't be having any lymphadenopathy or any organomegaly. While patients with leukemia, they present with the features of lymphadenopathy and organomegaly. And when we do bone marrow, we, we find hypocellular or acellular marrow in aplastic anemia as con compared to the leukemias where we will see the blast in the marrow. Then patient with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, it is also a very close differential diagnosis and many of the times patients of leukemia are misdiagnosed as GIA. So patients with leukemia when they present with these bony pains, they are often mistaken as GIA. But in juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis, the patients will mainly have joint pains and they won't have the features of uh, organomegaly except if it is a systemic uh, GIA as compared to the patients who present with the uh, uh, leukemias. And the other close differential diagnostic uh, dilemmas are infectious mononucleosis, ITP and Kawasaki. So ITP patient presenting with the isolated thrombocytopenia is very rare in the pediatric leukemia presentation. Then certain malignancies also mimic uh, the features, uh, the presentation of leukemias. So patients with non-Hodgkin lymphoma with bone marrow infiltration, patient with neuroblastoma stage 4 with bone marrow infiltration and patient with stage 4 rhabdomyosarcoma, they will have the bone marrow infiltration. So again, there will be disruption of the normal hematopoiesis in the patient present with the features of anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, they can be mistaken as uh, leukemias. So now coming to the treatment. So uh, right, first of all, we have to stratify the patient. So if it's a standard risk or high risk, and based on that, we can intensify our protocol. So overall, the treatment includes three parts. So it is induction, then consolidation, and then maintenance. So this induction and consolidation part generally takes six to eight months which is an intensive chemotherapy and the maintenance is a very low dose chemotherapy and it, the duration is generally two to three years. So the goal of induction chemotherapy 
is to eradicate the leukemic cells from marrow. So that is 99% reduction. So for clinical detection of leukemia, you should have 10 days to power 12 cells. And when you give chemotherapy and when you can decrease it to 10 days to power 9 cells, we can have the morphological remission. So the agents which are used in the induction chemotherapy is steroids, vincristine and l -asparginase. So using these two agents is led to uh, uh, able to achieve remission in 85% of the cases. And addition of anthracycline that is donorubicin or asparginase is able to attain remission in 95% of the children. So each of these chemotherapeutic agent has their peculiar uh, effect and peculiar side effect. So these steroids are the important backbone for the treatment of leukemia and the common side effect of the patients with steroids are uh, hyperglycemia, hypertension, increased risk of infection and myopathy. So we have to be very careful, we have to monitor the sugars, monitor the blood pressure for these children and we should be careful about the infections. Then the peculiar side effect of this vincristine, so vincristine is basically a mitosis inhibitor and the peculiar side effect for vincristine is neuropathy. It can cause either peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy. So these are the peculiar side effects of the uh, vincristine. This L asparginase, it is an enzyme. And the main complication with this, so there are basically three preparations of this L asparginase. So it is either derived from the E. coli enzyme or from the Arvenia enzyme or a pegylated form of E. coli. So, and the peculiar side effect of this L asparginase first is hypersensitivity. So, we should give a test dose before the administration of this L asparginase. And we have to give the first dose in presence of the uh, senior doctors. Other side effects are thrombosis, silent inactivation is another side effect of the L asparginase enzyme. Then this donorubicin, it is an anthracycline and we can omit anthracycline in a standard risk patient. While in a high risk patient, we can give a donorubicin based on which protocol do we use. And the complication of anthracycline is cardiotoxicity. So we should do an echo before the start of the donorubicin. And to address the CNS part, we have to give intrathecal therapy. So the thing is that systemic therapy, it won't cross the blood-brain barrier. So for the CNS-directed therapy, we have to give this intrathecal chemotherapy. And after this uh, four weeks of induction, we'll repeat a marrow to see for the uh, percentage of the blast so if it is less than 5% blast you say it is in the patient is in complete remission so that is what we anticipate now coming to the post induction therapy so post induction therapy is also called as consolidation therapy and the aim of this post induction therapy is to kill the residual cells which is present in the marrow so it is it consolidate or reinforce remission in both CNS and marrow compartment. So for CNS, we initially in the olden times, we used to use cranial irradiation. We used to irradiate every patient. But now in the latest protocol, we don't give cranial irradiation unless the patient is having CNS involvement. We don't use it as routinely as a prophylaxis. Or if the patient has high risk, like, TALL with high risk with high counts because they are at high risk of intellectual dysfunction and the secondary malignant neoplasm. And we can give intrathecal chemotherapy, mainly methotrexate, to provide the 
because this systemic chemotherapy won't cross the blood brain barrier so we will do a lumbar puncture and we'll give the chemotherapy in the cfcf space and it will reach the cns it will have the cns directed uh, approach and uh, apart from the cranial irradiation and intrathecal methotrexate we give high dose methotrexate so we have to give it in high dose concentration so that it can cross blood brain barrier and it can reach the cns and intensified therapy so basically uh, we give we again uh, give this induction we which is called as reinduction so we'll again uh, give another cycle of reinduction and there are various studies which have shown that giving reinduction has improved the outcomes and then there will be 2 to 3 years of maintenance chemotherapy so that mainly comprises of 6 6 uh, mp that is 6 mercaptopurine and methotrexate in certain protocol along with this they will use steroids and vincristin with intrathecal methotrexate so based on different protocol the duration of this maintenance chemotherapy ranges from 2 to 3 years and uh, this maintenance therapy is uh, helps to prevent the recurrence or to uh, for the acute leukemia